Brother Brooke. Or Brother Connor, <laughs> how are you, man? Very good, very good indeed. First time seeing each other in six months. When did we last see each other? This was April. It would have probably just been at some mediocre steak gaff in, in. I think it was at the lunch. Remember on the JBR yes, beach? For, yes. Who hosted was. that again? That was. Um, oh, who was that? So we had a lot of different characters. There, a lot of fitness people are there. Yeah. A lot of. Yeah, a lot yeah. of like a lot of PTs out here and stuff like that. I think it was hosted oh. by. There were a lot of different people there. Levy was there yeah. as well. Like Jovan, a, a guy. Adam from, was there. Yes, Jovan, a guy from Ireland who is. Uh, just an enormous human being and <laughs> a really really nice guy as well but a lot of new developments so we we talked then we we didn't talk too much about what was going on at the coaching program it was still still somewhat nascent like just coming coming in at the time and that was when the emails really started smashing for audacia as well when we were yeah. when we were when, when we were talking but what are the new the new developments because you've a couple of different projects obviously going on i know probably the coaching's taken up a lot of your time but you obviously have a new brand coming out. You have another project as well that you're working on. So what's been new? And like particularly, I want to lean on the coaching program because that's obviously grown massively in the last while. Yeah, so coaching program, I think last time we talked in April, it was me and David running it up still. But yeah. it was very, like we had some coaches and stuff, mm -hmm. but it was still very much, it wasn't a company yet, if mm -hmm. you know what I mean. It was very much just like personal brand, and then like a, a mentorship yeah. almost. We're now in the last five or six months it's become more of a, an actual company. So we have like a COO now, we have obviously you're helping out with the email coaching, we have different expert coaches in multiple areas, we have like a, a full support team. So it's turned into much more of an actual company. I'm still obviously very busy with that. On the personal branding side of things, I still host coaching calls, everything like that, but it's turned into more of a, an actual company rather than just like a personal brand um, with like a Calendly on your Twitter, <laughs> if yeah. that makes sense. Like we have a, like a website, we have all sorts of different coaches, everything like that. So much more, I would say, official feeling yeah. on the coaching side of things. But yeah, Adesha um, was going, yeah, at that time was doing very, very well. I'm not sure if we talked about this, but in the spring, so my best brand was Clearlight, the sauna brand. So I got an email when I was on vacation in Italy that they were shutting down their online dealer program completely. Mm -hmm. And that was like 40, 50% of my sales which was shocking. I think I think the reason they did it was because they thought I was taking their sales. Which is bizarre. Yeah. So after that, I had a decision to make. So I had like coaching program, I had a Dacia, and I could have kept running up a Dacia, but I was very open about it. Mm -hmm. And the best thing about Clearlight was that nobody, they wouldn't take on anybody new. So even if students saw my store, they couldn't copy Clearlight because they would just say, no, we're not taking on new dealers. But then once they ended their dealer program, everyone was copying every supplier on my website, like thousands of people, because my personal brand grew up much, much quicker than I, I thought it would. So I had a choice between like, okay, I can keep kind of building the store. And I definitely could have on a long-term basis, 100%. but it would have been like an uphill battle if like thousands of people were trying to copy exactly what you're doing. So I could either, my choices were to start a second store the same way or start my own brand. So I had at, at that point already built up obviously skills from running a Dacia and had some capital. So I just decided to go with my own brand. That's still in process now. I'm not sure if you were at the lunch at the Burge last year with Kian. Do you know Kian? I do. I, I know of him, but no, I was not at. So he's helping me with the product sourcing for my own brand now. So we're getting some samples in the next couple of weeks, but hoping to have my own products actually live by the end of the year. Beautiful. Beautiful. This is interesting because obviously we, we saw it when we began working together on Audacia, you, the coaching program wasn't there. Yeah. So then obviously we have intent based ads and everyone's competing on, on the same terms. They're like, that's copy Brooks store, like down, down yeah. to a letter, which is natural, which is, is naturally going to happen. It's the nature of the beast. I'm interested there on kind of what you're talking about. Cause I do want to lean into the coaching program, like for at least for the beginning, mostly. So we've, when we first met, it was probably August or no, it was probably June last year or something, something like that, June or July last year through launch socials. Yeah. And we were in that process of like you and I have always just aped into coaching programs and things like that. I, I would can't even imagine what I've spent on coaching programs, yeah. especially ones that didn't pan out whatsoever over complete rug pulls. So because I'm inside the, like the, the coaching program, obviously you see the results people are getting, which are pretty sick and it's actual intent on, on making sure everyone succeeds. So what do you think is the difference let's say between someone who's running up sort of a, a little info product company and it's it's not they don't have a proper team there and it's sort of 
look, we're doing this sort of mentorship. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. You and I have both done plenty of those. Yeah. So from making it a, a legit company, what do you think are the differences which change within a coaching program when you were taking it from, like you were saying, that personal brand with a Calendly link on there to now it being a legit company where the expenses are going to be a lot higher yeah. because you're putting, you have so much resource devoted to actually ensuring people succeed. Like you have proper coaches on, let's say the services side with what people are going to be doing to grow their store. You find the best agency owners around to help do that. You have lots of people on client success. What do you think are the, what's the, what's the leap you have to make to go from that personal brand up to there? What are the differences between those coaching programs? Cause they are essentially a completely different thing. They are. Uh, it's a really good point. Cause I think what a, a lot of the time on Twitter, what you'll see is kind of like me at the beginning, I was posting content for like one, two, three, four months. And I built a following of like 10, 15,000 people, but I only had my store. Mm -hmm. I had no coaching program. I had no course. I had nothing. So then when I launched the course, there's all this pent up demand mm -hmm. for months and months of posting. So then right away, you can do very, very well off organic. But a lot of the times what you'll see is people who do that after a couple months, it really dies out. Because while you have all this pent-up demand, when the pent-up demand goes, you can continue growing your personal brand, but it's much, much slower. Mm -hmm. So you'll see, like, you'll do, that's why you see coaching programs, like, really take off, and then they can't sustain it. It really dies out quickly. So I think on the long run, the only thing that can save you is actually getting client results. Like, if you have all this pent-up demand, you launch your program, you do very, very well, but then no one who joins your program gets the results and you have no case studies, then you're very quickly going to fizzle out. So I think by with those first people, when you can actually get them results, all people really want to see is case studies. Essentially in a, a business, starting a business offer, like a business opportunity offer is like, they want to see that people have actually done this and gotten results. So then once you have that, that's where you can really turn it into a real company. And you have to also accept the fact that you're going to have to devote significant resources into coaching, into your team. Like a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll run up like a, a webinar offer mm -hmm. with like, I don't know, $1,000, $2,000. But it's just group coaching. Like, there's not really any fulfillment. It's just here's your course, here's your two group co coaching goals a week. Good luck. Yeah. Where with ours, we did it where every person gets their own one on one coach. We were like, my payroll now, just for context, is like close to 150K a month on payroll alone. So to, to ever fulfill that scale where you're actually like having lots of people come in every month and they're all gonna have like a good chance at getting good results, you have to be willing to do that. Because one person, you can't really fulfill that scale because you only have so much time. And for people who are new to business, like a complete beginner, they have to have some element of one-on-one. -on -one. Like you can't just expect someone who has no business experience to go through a course, hop on one hour group coaching call a week and figure everything out. Obviously there's gonna be some people who can, but for the large majority of people to give them like a good shot, they need like some element of one-on-one -on -one attention, I would say. So to do that, that's gonna, if you're gonna give one-on-one -on -one detention to people at scale, that means higher payroll. Mm -hmm. A lot of people aren't okay with that because it eats into your margins. 100%. That, that does seem to be the main difference where it's actually having proper staff. Yeah. Where, you know, we, I think we've, we've touched on this before. A lot of people where, where we, we see, particularly in, I would say, info, a lot of people just don't actually run proper businesses. It's not a business. It's not a business. Yeah. It's not an actual enterprise where you, where you have, you know, you have the right story. Like I would always break an agency down into... Not, not necessarily, you know, lead gen sales fulfillment, but on the fulfillment side, because that's most complex, is getting the right structure in place, getting the right people into those seats within the structure, and then having the right kind of processes around that to support them. The hard part it, about a coaching as well compared to an agency is like when you get an agency client, um, I think an agency is a harder business to run. But when you get a client, they pay you every month. Mm -hmm. Where with a coaching business, usually the person's paying you. So like if you join today, you're going to pay me whatever today. But then I get that money now, but then I have to then take that and I have to use that to fulfill the next six months. Yes. So if, you, if you're not getting new people in every month, then you have to still pay the team regardless for the duration of, so it's, it's less, it's very, um, it's harder cash flow wise. You get all the cash up front, but then you have to then hire and build this team to fulfill on that for the next six months. Where an agency client, if they pay you 3,000 a month, they're gonna pay you $18,000 over the six months. Yes. So you can devote way more resources in terms of your team to that person. You know what I mean? Exactly. You can you can predict that, and it's it's like that. All the all the work that you're doing on the content. We were talking about paid ads earlier as well, of how that's kind of more predictable. We'll talk about the difference between organic and paid as well. But just finishing off on that point, I'd be interested to hear your take on this because I saw a tweet from maybe it was you or someone like yeah. that, someone like that where 
he's talking about, and this is the, the difference we're talking about between coaching programs and let's say someone running something that is essentially an, in, an, an info business, is that the whole business is the claim. Mm -hmm. So someone else could go through the course, they could take your ads, take your claim, and they could run off the same the same business. But what's happened now in your case is that they're not going to be able to build out that organization structure. They're not going to be able to hire the right people. They're not going to be able to make the process around it to support them. So these are sort of internal moats, and that they seems are. to be the difference where your business isn't a claim because there's actual results that are that are being gotten, and that's from being willing to have 150k in payroll, where a lot of these guys are, you know, they're 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 running it off of VAs. You're so right. It's a it's like um. As you go, like as you grow a coaching business, like it's very easy. Like I would say it's very easy to do like a hundred grand your first month. If you have like 10,000 followers that you've just been giving value to, mm -hmm. it's very easy to just do like a hundred thousand dollars for a couple months. Very easy. Mm -hmm. Not very easy to do that for two years in a row. And because then you have to build up the actual team. And like you said, it, it turns into a moat. And like, for example, on a webinar offer, um, if you're going to spend 20 grand a day for a week, that's 140 K cash flow until you even make one sale. So that's a moat. Not everyone can do that. Not everyone can pay 20 grand in ads a day every day for a week and then wait another week after that to get the cash flow. So yeah. as you build the business, like there's different things that can turn into moats. One of them being case studies is the biggest moat. Like yes. if, if there's two programs that are the same offer and one has a whole bunch of case studies, one doesn't. Like you, the person with case studies can charge double the price and still get clients over the person who doesn't have any case studies. So case studies is the number one moat. And then it's just really business structure, like a team. Like if you have a team of people like I do now, where I have like six or seven coaches in my program who have used the exact program to build mm -hmm. six figure a month stores, that's a moat because like another guy, if he doesn't have any case studies who can do that, then he has to coach himself or he has to hire VAs. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there are moats that you can build around the business as you go. And that's the hard part about it. It's like, it's very easy to do it one or two months at the beginning, very hard to have an actual long-term sustainable business that lasts like years and years. Yeah. I think the way you can identify that is obviously you've just been high ticket e since you since you started in business. Yeah, I, I know you had done some drop some normal drop shipping stuff before that, but it's been it's been high ticket e all the way. You can spot people who are doing this when they jump to different things yes. year to year because they're jumping from claim to claim essentially, and they're they're out competing by having better marketing and better personal branding. You know, you might see someone who naming no names in particular is let's say an agency guru for years and years now it starts teaching remote closing and things yeah. like that do you know and, but it's jumping from claim to claim because the results are completely dropping off from what they're doing because they're not running it properly and ensuring people hit success exactly because if they were like if the if the first claim was actually getting people results that would just bring more people in yeah and there would be good word of mouth that would organic that would exponentially grow the business but uh, like you said if you're not getting results and people aren't happy with the program you have to switch yeah first program i ever got was sam ovens's consulting accelerator and it's funny when you say that it was because of the case studies it was because he had a wall of client interviews i mean you would have to scroll for minutes to get to the end of it like that's it, such a moat such a moat yeah so then with the with with the coaching program so we're talking about the launch is the easy part yeah. in a sense because you have the pent-up demand so we talked about paid ads and having a sustainable front end because that's obviously the hard part and content while great and it's an amazing thing you have twitter you've instagram you've youtube you have probably some other ancillary platforms TikTok. you're now it seems like the growth which has happened because even from when we from when we talked even from being inside the program it's like damn there's a lot of people joined in here yeah like, and and the the my my calls are more active the chat's more active things like that so on the front end to make it sustainable can you is there a way to make content more sustainable to have it not have those massive ebbs and flows you might have where it's that inconsistency and then if you could maybe touch on the content piece first of, of ensuring that that is consistent all the way along but then primarily maybe on the paid ads because yeah. that's probably more so where predictability comes into the equation Hundred percent. Yeah, I think we were talking about this in the way here, but like with organic, I think Hormozzi said this. Like, what you're building with organic is like the exponential return is the audience. Mm -hmm. That's that's the value. But if you're making content and you like, if you're relying primarily on organic to drive leads, if you stop making content, your leads are going to stop. So you're you're trading your time for money in a way. But you're doing so in a way that's building this audience, which is the actual value of doing that. But to grow and scale a business primarily on organic, um, 
it's very hard because if you stop making content, your business stops growing. Where if you put your time into making one banger ad, you can spend $20,000 a day on the banger ad, pushing it to as many people as you want. So that's where the predictability comes into play. But I think the other element with organic that you can do is running your email marketing properly. Like if you build up an email list of whatever, 20, 30, 50, 100,000 people, obviously you don't want to be dropping offers to them every single day. Because like the people are going to say yes, they're going to say yes, and then you're not going to have any more people yeah. unless more are coming on the list. But I think if you structure it in a way where you're like doing um, a CTA once a month around angles. So like for, for net right now it would be like, do you have time to build a business that still does well this Q4? And then in December it will be, you can start the new year well with a new business. You can like have these strategic offers and CTAs to join yeah. in between giving them a whole bunch of value every day. Like that would be the sustainability organic wise, but it's still nothing compared to paid ads, in yeah. my opinion. So I, I've seen you, you advertise on YouTube, you advertise on Meta, of course, through Facebook, Instagram. I'm sure they're completely different where your, yeah. your YouTube yeah. ad is essentially going to be a VSL almost. It's going to be a long form long form piece and it's going to have to be one banger composition where you want to have even before you set it live you want a pretty high level of certainty that that's going to be able to to withstand a lot of spend at a target cost per book call so do you find those platforms is there one you prefer they're very different so the youtube algorithm is um much more complex if you get an ad that can work on youtube it can work anywhere anywhere, any platform. If you get an ad that works on Facebook, if you have five ads that work on Facebook, they might not all work on YouTube. They're right. very different platforms. So you think like, think of the type of person who's watching a YouTube video, they're learning, mm -hmm. they, they're, they're invested in like sitting down and watching YouTube videos, yeah. learning. Um, where someone on Instagram is just like scrolling a, a feed, short, shorter attention spans. So like, I think on, um, Instagram's easier to do right away. Um, very easy to just like pop up and out in it to do quite well. Where YouTube, it's much, much harder to crack, but if you crack it, it the the potential is way, way higher. Like you could run, you could scale to like 30, 40,000 a day with one ad wow. very easily, and it's not ever gonna really peter out. Where Instagram, like the thing, the thing with Instagram is like, it's essentially just, it's everything in one. Like you have your cold, but then it's also remarketing to those people yes. itself, where, where YouTube, isn't so much like that. The audience is way bigger on YouTube. So I think overall, um, I've done remarketing on YouTube. That's probably why you get them. Yeah. Um, which does well, but I've yet to crack YouTube paid. Yeah. So Instagram and Facebook pay like cold is usually like what we do now is we have a $1 funnel. So like yes. uh, someone instead of just, cause when we're doing webinar, the issue with webinar is like a lot of those leads just want the free webinar. Yeah. And they're very bad quality leads. So now when you run a $1 funnel, even just getting someone to take out their credit card and buy a $1 offer, exponentially higher quality lead. So of rather course. than having a thousand webinar leads a day, we'd have 200 $1 buyers a day. Yeah. So then that's much, much higher value. And then we can have like setters, SDRs reach out to the buyers. Yes. So that's the funnel we're using now. And even then though, like all we're really trying to do on the $1 funnel is there's like a $1 order bumps one-time um, one time offer yeah. and then a second one-time offer. So all we're really trying to do there is get like a 0.8x ROAS same day. We can get 0.8x ROAS same day, so if I spend 5,000 bucks, I can get 4,000 back same day, but then have 200 buyers that we can then call and ascend into the higher tier programs, that's, that's a big win. That is a massive win. And it's interesting there, I've talked about this with Daniel Fazio, mm -hmm. of with these funnels, that person, even if it's a dollar, that's still a threshold that they've crossed. It, they are now at least a buyer. They took a credit card out. They took a credit card out. Yeah. And we have a saying, you might have this in Canada, because Can this saying, because Canada has sort of a, it's really, the, the culture is interesting where you have a lot of British elements in the, mm -hmm. in the, in the, in the culture as well. well we, we'd have a saying at home, in for a penny, in for a pound. Yeah. So if you, if you get a small commitment from someone, it's far easier to get a large commitment later than exactly. if you ask for that upfront. And so even some, th that's such an indication of trust that they, and, and desire that they actually want what you're selling. So I'm sure, I'm sure with the SDR team, you probably see pretty insane uptakes even on, oh, even, yeah. even on 200 leads. Yeah. So yeah, we're, we're, we've been playing around with a whole bunch of different ideas, but it's, it's way better. Like in, in, but there's also a long buying journey. So like, let's say like we've seen, for example, I saw a call book last week. The guy came in through the $1 funnel, mm -hmm. but then he clicked like three YouTube videos, clicked my Instagram bio, clicked my Twitter bio, clicked another paid mm -hmm. ad. So I'm finding now that a lot of the time, like organic content, the value of organic content um, isn't only growing your audience, it's once you get a paid buyer in through cold 
or just a webinar lead in. Once you get people into your ecosystem, you have to then nurture them. Like very, very unlikely someone's going to click your webinar ad and then feel comfortable giving you thousands of dollars that day. Very, very unlikely. Yes. So once they click your webinar ad, they get on your email list, they follow you on social media, they want to watch your content for like three to five weeks and then they'll feel comfortable. Of course. So that's the value of organic content. To me now, like that's even almost as much as growing the audience itself. I guess it is growing the audience in a sense, but it's giving value to this cold audience that isn't coming through organic. Of course, yeah, because yeah, people do bounce around for before they make any decision. It's yeah. even even on us on a lower ticket purchase. I think you and I might be a bit different in that we seem to just jump into things a bit more. I don't even want the sales call. Like, yeah, right. if, I, if I wanted, I just want to give you the credit card and go in. Yeah, yeah. let's YOLO. Yeah. just the, the, applying the YOLO principle. But <laughs> the it, it's it's interesting. People will bounce around. They want to suss you out across yeah. many different platforms. Even if you were to if in a B two B service context, if you were to cold email someone. You, you want to fuse your marketing into the process. Like, you want them to see your YouTube. You want them to see your, your Twitter. You want them to see yeah. your, your, link, your LinkedIn. You want them to see all of you. So then, then they'll book a call because they do look you up and see are you legit first. If you, if you cold emailed me and I didn't know who you were, the first thing I do is type your name or agency on Google. And then if I see a YouTube channel and I go watch your videos, I'm like, holy shit, God knows who's talking about. Then maybe I want to book a call. Exactly. But not from a cold email alone. Of course not. Yeah. So it is, it is all of these things particularly with the organic, I think the wrong, when, when you're looking at paid being so sustainable, the, almost the wrong conclusion to draw would be that we, let's just focus on paid, even even with it working so well, particularly on, on Meta. But it's a lot of a lot of what's working well there is sort of a flywheel and, yeah. an, and an ecosystem effect where they are looking around. So you almost can't quantify you can't. The, the return of your, of your organic You content. can on a long time frame. Yeah. Like that, like that, I was talking to... Um, uh, a buddy of mine, he's literally like um, Grant Cardone's media buyer. So he spends wow. like 600 grand a day for Grant Cardone. But he was saying like he doesn't even look at the return on his meta account anymore. Like what he does is he has a global return, organic, YouTube, Facebook, everything. And the only thing he looks at is the global return. Because he said, oftentimes you'll see your CPA go up on Facebook and you're like, oh, I have to turn my ads down. The CPA is going up. But if you look at it globally, it's actually going down because all these people are coming in through the Facebook are then watching the organic and then they're buying. Yes. So you have to really zoom out to get an accurate accurate read of what your paid's doing. Right, reading it through high rather than the, the ads manager or, or, or whatever other platform. But even you, then you have to factor into your ROAS, how much are you spending on organic? Because the organic is then nurturing the paid. So you just have to have like an overall ROAS. How much did I spend total? on marketing paid editors everything and then how much did i get back yes yeah. very true very very true so so we, t we touched on the sdrs as well so building out the sales team i'm sure that's so I, I know when it when it began obviously david is doing a lot of the sales david's really really good at sales and then you obviously <laughs> you got quite good at sales as well very quickly and of course there's going to be a halo effect of them speaking to you and, th and things like yeah, that which would yeah. which would help well, how have you, you know, you see a lot of, a lot of sales coaching programs and you're like, how many of these closures are we going to make? But the, how do you, even despite that, I could be wrong, but there doesn't seem to be a large quantity of really good salespeople. And oftentimes a lot of people who come into, who come into the online world, they don't have that, what I would call real sales background of end to end sales. Yes. So if you're just a closer in a way it's you, you need to you need you need to i think at least know the the some methodology behind actually generating your own leads and obviously Devante is really good at that as well yeah so you i know i think it was pretty recent you started working with Devante, but how did the sales team evolve did you from going to when it was one or two people on the phones in the beginning probably just doing 12 hours of calls a day nearly to then building out a sales team and how you have sdrs and stuff like that sourcing good people, tracking them, you know, in, ensuring things are done to the highest standard. I'm sure running a sales team as well is a bit of a different beast when you're when you're at scale. Dude, it's a really good question. So the whole reason, so like you said at first, it was just me and David doing calls. That was it. Yeah. Then we, the next closers we brought on were three guys. So I stepped out of sales and then our closers from like, when David left in end of May, so from like June, July, August, our three closers were just students who had done well in the program who had sales experience. Mm -hmm. So they had built successful stores. So it's, it's almost like talking to me anyway. Like you're talking to someone who's run a successful store, which I thought was, was very good. Yeah. Um, the, I'll go into it more in a bit, but so then after that, we, we, we launched the webinar offer. So this was just high ticket. Then we launched the webinar and in the first month of the webinar, the huge issue was, so just 
you, you'll probably be like amazed by this. We brought in 12,000 new leads from August 20th to September 5th. <laughs> Something like that. 20,000 new leads, and we saw a 0% uptick in high ticket sales. Wow. Not none. So we didn't have any SDRs. So no SDRs, we're bringing in all these leads. Some were booking calls, but the, the issue was people from this, these webinar leads were booking calls. We would be getting like 15, 20 calls a day, but they were all no-showing. They weren't showing up because mm -hmm. they were low-quality leads that didn't have any background on me. So then only like five, four or five calls were happening a day. So we're bringing in 20,000 leads over like a two and a half week period, wherever it was, no uptick. So then what we did at that point was like the benefit of a webinar is you don't need a sales team per se. I can sell to a thousand people at once. Yeah. That's, that's the model. But the, we were profitable on the webinar, but it wasn't, um, the issue was show rate. So we were at like a 1.3x webinar by car close. So like yeah. webinar Sunday, you can buy for three days after that till Wednesday. So mm -hmm. by like the end, we were at like a 1.2, 1.3x ROAS with a 13% show rate, which is very low. So if we simply had a higher show rate, we'd have been at like three to four X just on the webinar, not including any high ticket. It was just like that. So the issue was show rate. So we thought we're going to hire SDRs to call all these opt-ins. Yeah. Every single one to get them to come to the webinar. But then it became quickly apparent. We're adding like 1,000, 1,200 leads a day. It takes like a big sales team. So that's when we decided to pivot to, instead of having 1,200 leads a day, we're going to have 100, 200 buyers a day. So then that's when we um, brought on Devante. And this is another moat, is most guys who are just running a personal brand with a Calendly, no sales team. Yeah. If you have a good dialed in sales team, like that's like we were, I was talking about this with uh, Andre, like Grant Cardone, his sales team's so good. If he ran ads, paid ads to an opt in, and then it just sent you to a blank page, like you opt in and then you just go to a white page, he's still going to be like eight to 10 X ROAS because his sales team is going to call every single one of those people. He has so many offers that he can make so much on the back end from his dialed in sales team. So that's what we are trying to build now. So Devante came in, he's running that. Um, we have, so he has a big email list of like closes and stuff. So I think we have four or five now. So we have like um, some in the DMs, some on doing dialing the buyers, but that's kind of the, I think a big mode as well. It's like when we actually have this dialed in sales team built in, it's really getting there. Like we're already seeing yeah. insane results from having that. Yeah, and I, I'm even thinking on the modes there where you have to get to a point where you're, in, in a way you are overseeing everything, but it's sort of, you, if you think of an org chart and you have sort of you here. Like and then, I, I and can't then, do content sales. Can't do all of it. No, you can't. Yeah. So then you maybe have, let's say your head of fulfillment, then you have this branch which goes down into coaches and stuff like that. You have your head of sales, which goes down into the sales team, the SDRs and closers. You have another branch of the, the content team where you're, you, you're feeding into it. Yeah. So the, the, the trend there is that all of these things obviously cost money. Let's say yeah. for to to have that sort of organizational structure there, where you're getting in someone like Devonte as well, where he's not exactly a budget option. He's the best. Exactly. Do, do you know what I mean? So yeah. So that's that's interesting. How quick it how quick it's evolved. I've always I've always noted this about you, and of course Kieran, you know Kieran Finn, where successfully delegating things has been a strong point. You know, mm -hmm. for, for both of you guys. And I think personality wise, sometimes you're quite similar as well to me in, in some respects. So how, how quick did you have to delegate things? Because it grew so quick and then you have to, you have to get all these people in place pretty rapidly yeah. to, to actually keep it going. And then now, how does it look of how you're actually able to oversee everything? How is data feeding back to you? You know, what, what, what do you actually look at? So how did you go from that, that delegation to, to, to get to that point in the org chart? And, yeah. then, and then now what do you look at? So like on the sales side of things now, I just look at how many calls are booked today, how many dials did we do, like just like very high KPI numbers. On the fulfillment side, like I'm obviously running my own coaching calls and stuff still, but uh, we get like how, what were the student results this week? I'm going Student results this week, like how many people hit 10K? How many people hit 50K? How many calls are the success managers getting? So then like if I see like someone's got like 25 calls a week, okay, we probably need to hire a new success manager soon. So mainly just looking at KPIs from everything, but um, I'm still very actively involved. Like I'm not trying to like get out of the business. Like I don't think that's yeah. realistic where I'm gonna, just gonna be like, I could just go to a beach for a month and everything's gonna be fine. I don't think that's realistic or even desirable for a coaching business. Like I don't wanna be the person who's not even to be found in the group. So I wanna be active in the group, but in terms of like a delegation, like obviously I can't be running the sales team myself. I can't be doing everything, 
So I mainly just get KPIs on like a daily, yeah. weekly basis that I can then look at that allows me to like spot problems if there is any. Very interesting. Yeah, th this and this is something I tweeted before where people are people want to remove themselves from the business. I'm like, why? Like, yeah. what, what could be more important? Yeah. Do you know, it's it, it's it's interesting. Maybe if you're looking, maybe if you've run a business for ten years and you're trying to focus on different things, maybe you're you're running another company and this one is just humming along. Yeah. And it's in a very good position. Do you know, but people are trying to remove themselves from the business, it's something, it's almost a fantasy people have in some respects. And wh why, why would you want that? You, you need your finger on the pulse for years, actually. I would say probably a time horizon for mastery in a business model is, and, and I haven't gotten there yet, is I would, to me it would be at least five years. At least, I agree. So to actually get yourself out of that, you want to, <laughs> you want to, you want to get up, you want to get up to, to that position over time and it's a it's a process to get through that where you're slowly relinquishing responsibilities to other key members in the in the organization but i think it's very important like you don't want to do it too quick because like i was talking to a guy who runs like a really big successful agency and he, an older guy mm -hmm. and he was like talking to me about what his agency does and it was very clear he had no idea what he was talking about like Right, n completely out of touch with the times. No idea. So I'm, even though his agency is successful, he himself not up to speed. So I think it's very important to not let that happen. And that's what happens if, if you delegate too much and you don't have your finger on the pulse and you're mm -hmm. not. I think that's the advantage of being on Twitter. Like your 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 ear is right to the ground. Yeah. Like all the newest things, that's where you see them. Yeah. Right. Like even things like AI sales. Like I had one call me yesterday as a demo. Like an SDR AI called me and like you wouldn't know it's an AI. Wow. But like if you went and told someone running a, a 200 person company of salespeople, they probably would have no idea what that even is yet. You know what I mean? Like the, the higher up you go and the more you delegate, the the less out of touch with the, the, the common trends and the hot, the market itself you become. So I think it's very important to manage that. I completely agree. And it, it's it's actually very funny when you see that. I think Twitter people are a different breed in many respects where you see people on on Instagram who are maybe in the coaching space and for them it's like it's still 2018 yeah you know with with some of the some of the the things that they're that they're pulling the other thing on on Twitter and in a way it's still maybe it's not your main platform but it's certainly the first one that you built up where if word of mouth travels very quickly on on Twitter yeah so if someone if a coaching program or even an agency won't last on Twitter unless the results that they're getting are, are good yeah they, it absolutely won't last because people will hear about it you know, we, we get a lot of our clients from Twitter and it, they're the clients that almost make me nervous in a sense where we, we always over deliver for them. But let's say if, let's say it, some, some things in the client relationship are, they are on their side, you know, to, to ensure, to, to ensure it works. Yeah. It, is, it is a two way street. And you're thinking for, for leads to come on Twitter, it's like that reputation that I've built up is precious. Oh yeah. Where, yeah. where, you know, we, we have, even now, Twitter as it's sophisticated, I we we book calls from Twitter, and the person will generally say that they've spoken to a couple of people on Twitter about us first. So it's not even that they see and immediately trust you and book first. It's like they'll talk to their friends yeah. as well. So that reputation that you have is everything. Even like as an ecom brand owner now, I would never just like I would never hire an agency unless I spoke to one of their clients. Yeah, ever. No, one hundred percent. Yeah. 100% it, it is key and we, we have people ask that and that's why we put client interviews on our website also like we're saying the, the case studies are remote in yeah. similar in any because you can put coaching in, into being a service business as well it absolutely is a service business in many respects it, many of the same characteristics so that that's absolutely key that that level of of trust but it's some it's interesting with a lot of coaches from Instagram word doesn't travel as quick it on doesn't a, on a platform YouTube. like that. It's not a town square yeah. the, way, the way Twitter is. So you can get away with, with things for a long time. You see people who come from, excuse me, you see coaches who come from Instagram and YouTube to Twitter and they get flamed yeah. very quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they can't last in that environment because word travels so quickly. So if, if you're able to, to last on Twitter, it is a very good sign re regardless of, of whatever business you run. Um, Unless you're you're a dropshipper who's living in Dubai, that, that's what, that's when the, the red flags are coming on. If it's some guy from Slovenia or something like yeah, that, yeah, yeah. But very interesting. So then, as well, the coaching program is obviously doing extremely well. But you're you're doing the brand. It's it's interesting. You still have a draw to ecom, 
in general where you you see I, I would say that class of person we've talked about who 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 isn't doing things the right way in in coaching they'll think e-com is in a very appealing model it's interesting that you still have a desire to go into that and build up a brand again yeah so wh- wh- why, why do you think that still is what what's drawing you to that a couple things first is if i want the coaching program to last i need to actually be doing e-com mm-hmm. like if i if i just have like a lot of people they'll ha- they'll do i don't know well with e-com or well with amazon and then they'll start the coaching program it'll be more profitable quicker they'll stop their their e-com their amazon whatever they're doing and just go on the coaching program and then they might do it for a year or two but then their knowledge will quickly dry out and it won't be up with the times anymore and then their coaching program will go to shit yeah essentially so by having my own e-com brand and with with high ticket dropshipping you're um it's very it's perfect for beginner because you have very little starting capital like you can get started with like a thousand dollars with my own brand like i'll have to invest like 50 to 100k in inventory so like i have so much skin in the game I'm very, very incentivized to have all the newest, fresh, fresh knowledge yeah. that then I can then filter back into the coaching program. So it's a very, it's like a positive feedback loop. I'm incentivized for the brand to have all the best, freshest knowledge to get all the best, um, best agency owners on my own brand yeah. for the purpose of the brand. But then I can then hire those people like you, yeah. like Trigby, the SEO guy, to then teach the coaching program. Yes. So it's, it's very much a, a positive feedback loop. And the one downside of a coaching business is you, you can't really exit it. Like if, yeah. I guess you, you can sell it, but they would want me to stay on as the face. So whether I want to do that or not, I have no idea at any point. But, but with an e-com business, it's something that I can, like I don't think a coaching program, I, I don't see myself working on it for the next 20, 25 years. An e-com business, yes, I, I can definitely work on that for the next 20, 25 years. Yeah. But you can grow that as big as you want into a multi-billion dollar company. You know what I mean? Where a coaching program is very unlikely going to be that. It's excellent um, for cash flow. But it's not a long-term, like 20, 25 year long business that you want to be running when you have a family and kids. Yes. In my opinion. I agree. And also, I think that would lead to almost a coaching program 2.0 in a sense, in terms of the front end. It would be such a revival if you if you get me, as in, in terms of the whole messaging on the front end. The, the content I like the most in the business space, there, there's, a certain, there's a certain class of, of person where their their content is just here's what i'm doing that's the best type it's, of content it's the best type of content so if yeah. you're if you're simply documenting if you've seen matt kelly from space goods where he's he's documented his his building up the brand now to colty and marco with kill crew same colty and marco yeah. but i i look at like i want matt does this weekly documenting the journey video on his on his youtube i watch it every week that's what i want to do like and with my own brand i've been doing two emails a week where i'm going to build it from the ground i want to do a youtube thing as well yeah but that's the best kind of content absolutely it's so we, you have you, you have this effect of of it's it's not even it's not even selling it's not you having to it's not you having to go into very technical content on things you will do that still to to have to still be providing a lot of value to the audience before they they maybe want to want to jump into to the program and things like that but does that excite you let's say if you were do you almost have something in mind with doing the brand where you're thinking okay this is going to this is going to be sort of brook 2.0 going going up on youtube and it'll be almost more of that sort of candid yeah here's exactly what i'm doing i think like content i think now like a lot of the best brands have a face so for example like uh yeah, represent. Perfect example. Uh, first form with Handy Frisella. So a lot of the biggest, most well-known, strongest brands have a face to them. It's not like it's not like represent is George Heaton's um, personal brand, but he is the face of the brand. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think having something like that is is huge going forward because people like I guess you can have a strong brand, but if it's just a faceless brand. People don't really. It's hard. To, it's harder to connect with mm-hmm. than if you see the owner of the brand literally living its values on a daily basis. It's very easy to connect with that, yeah. and very. Um, it's very powerful in a way. Yeah. So I think like that's my vision for the brand I'm starting now is to document the whole thing and to then have that strong personal brand where I'm the face of the brand, but the brand's still its own thing. Yeah. And for we we, we won't go into the specifics on on the brand before before it's like fully. F- running but obviously the products that you're selling you use them so yeah. like these are things that you use you use daily yeah so yeah we won't we won't go into like the the two two fine weeds before before it's actually launching and and, and steam is gathered but it, it will be quite easy for you to to do that 
it, when, when these are things that you use every day. That's exactly. The, it, it's the same. It's almost a similar, I suppose, a similar concept to you having three successful students be sales people for the for the coaching program earlier on, mm-hmm. because it, there's no better conviction than well, yeah, I used it and here I am. Exactly. You just want to build products that you would use, that you would like. Like that's the easiest way to build a brand. Is like there's probably someone who has the same problems and same interests as you and just build a problem to fix yeah. that. And it's really like, I think a lot of people think when they're starting, like the hardest thing is picking a, a product, picking a winning idea even, but it's really easy. Like once you actually get in the market and you see like a lot of the products on the market now aren't very good in a lot of areas. You know what I mean? Like it's not hard to build a better version of what's on the market a lot of the time. Completely agree. Yeah. And and there what what's nice is that so I absolutely love running the agency where I talk to other agency owners and they're like, I, <laughs> I, I don't understand how, how you enjoy that, but I, I really do. And it's manic at the moment. Obviously, we have a waiting list and, and things like that at the minute. And there are brands, particularly referrals from our own clients who want to come on. We're like, oh, sorry, like we'll, it'll be December before we can we can do anything, maybe January. Um, but there is something very attractive about e-com still to me. Obviously, the agency is in e-com and I, I, I really... Obviously, we had that. People people think that we're very late to e-com. And in a sense, in terms of the Facebook ads goal rush of 2014, yes. Yeah. But it's really not in the grand scheme of things when you think of purchases moving from being in person to being more online. I, I don't shop for many things in person anymore. Me either. Never. So the, the, that that trend is is only increasing. The, the thing I really like, though, as compared to an agency or even a coaching program, is that with e-com, still rare, but within e-com, you can absolutely deliver excellence at scale. That's I think that's it's the, the beautiful part. It's just the opposite. Like with coaching an agency, the more clients you get, the harder it is to, to keep your fulfillment quality high. Yeah. With e-com, the more products you're selling, your costs go down the higher you get. To, to order a thousand units versus ten is going to be cheaper per unit to order a thousand. So yeah. as you scale the business, it's actually easier to keep your fulfillment quality high. Exactly, and you can continue refining the products you over can, time. You can continue listening to you can continue listening to customers and seeing what they actually want. You can you can call every customer and say, "How can I make this better? How can I make this better?" And you can constantly edit and improve. Another thing is like compared to coaching or an agency, like you only have so many people who you can sign as a client. Ecom brand owners, and only so many ecom brand owners. Yeah. For coaching, it's like you're selling. No matter what, when you're selling coaching, it, this person still has to do a whole bunch of work. There's yeah. no getting around it. For them to get the result, they have to work their ass off. Where you can sell a physical product, you literally give someone something tangible that they can then see in their house or on their wall that it's very, they can feel the value more. Even if they don't ever, never use it, it's right there. Yeah. Where a coaching program, if they come in and then they don't do anything, they feel like they didn't get anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's their fault. Yeah. It's their fault, but they're still going to be annoyed at you. Exactly. And, and, and pin the blame. And the, the kind of people to not do anything themselves and to to not actually use the resources available to them they are people who are often predisposed to blaming others for their problems and then but that's a lot of people like that oh it's a huge it's a huge portion it's a huge portion yeah it's like you you touched on there are some people where you had it with jack and joel yeah i think we we had it with them where they were on i think a couple of my coaching calls in the beginning and you could you just got a sense you're like yeah these guys go on places yeah you You just you know right away you know right away some some people just we we would say uh, another little Irish quip is we would say some someone has the minerals or not. It's like, do you have the minerals? And some people, some people just absolutely have the minerals, and a little bit of guidance will send them a long way. That's the hard part with coaching programs. Is like you can often tell, but are you supposed to then tell people they can't join because you don't think they have it? That's the ethical question you have to ask. If someone wants to join your coaching program and you don't think they're going to succeed, yeah, you let it, them join or not? It's such a, it is such a tough one because in that moment as well, especially for a sales rep, there's commission on the line. There's, there's yeah. the, this sort of thing. So it, it's, I think you just have to be honest about how hard it's going to be. You're gonna have to work this many hours. You're not going to make a hundred grand next week. And if they still want to do it, like, I, I don't think it's necessarily your spot to tell them they shouldn't. Oh, it's, it's absolutely not. If yeah. someone, someone's an adult and you're, you're very clearly laying out the, the expectations of them in order to actually succeed, then of course, of course that's the, the balls in their court. So within ecom this kind of brings us to dubai a bit mm-hmm. because we're you know dubai like for for both of us i would say we're actually quite family oriented people so 
in a way you kind of want to be a bit closer to home mm-hmm. you know D- dubai is closer to home for me in ireland than it is for you in canada but that i think starting a brand i would love to be in the weeds in person making sure everything's perfect at least for the first year yeah and be being a uh, being at home and the fulfillment would always be in Ireland for, well, actually Northern Ireland for a couple of reasons, for 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 a couple of reasons shipping wise. But I'd be I'd be interested to hear on, let's say, time horizons for the brand. I know I know you're going to be doing this now, but for when it's really booting off and, and scaling, do you want to be back in Canada? We talk about Florida. We you know there there are different options. Do you want to be really in person, like in in the warehouse where you're with the team and you're making sure everything is tip top and 100%. you're you're ensuring that? So then, okay, so you would like to be there. Do you have any sort of time horizon for you being in Dubai? Is this a three year play? Is it a five year play? What are you What are you thinking there? Yeah. So the company of the brand is a U.S. company. Mm-hmm. I started a U.S. company for it. So that will start this year. I think, obviously, I'm not a U.S. citizen, but I think like I, we we want to get U.S. citizenship. So yeah. I think there's a, if you have ten U.S. based employees, you get citizenship. Is essentially at a high level the rule. Wow. So I'd like to build the company to ten U.S. based employees in the next couple of years, mm-hmm. and then we'll probably buy a house in Florida, and then at that point it'll just I'll just have to ask my accountant, my lawyer, whatever what makes sense tax wise if I can really minimize my tax bill, and just be in Dubai three months a year. It makes sense, but I think like on um, probably the next one to two years, we'll have uh, at least a place in Florida, and then whether we're going back and forth to Dubai, I'm not really sure. But I think the most I would want to be in Dubai at all is like four or five years. Yeah, because uh, we want to have kids a lot, so I think like with one kid maybe doable, two maybe. But once you have like three or four kids, you can't be going back and forth between you Dubai can't. and Florida multiple times. It's not doable. No, you're you're organized an army there, trying to get onto it, the trying to get onto planes and off. Yeah, it's yeah. It's, it's just difficult. But yeah. I think I think on the in-person point, I think to really grow a brand, it has to be like you have to have an office, you have to have a warehouse of people. Yeah. Like you can start one without that, but I think to really at scale, do it right, you you do need it I think. to deliver that excellence. Because yeah. even we're saying we're not saying e-com brands will deliver excellence at scale. We're just saying they can. They can. It's just possible. Most of them don't. The hardest part, even with the coaching business, is like we, you want to have a. Um, um, a culture of excellence where everyone is expected to do excellent job at everything fulfillment <laughs> sales like everyone but when you have people all over the world in different time zones it's very hard to do that you need to ha- you need to constantly be on people where yeah. in an office when you're all in one place you stick out like a sore thumb if you're not no matter what you're doing because it's all there you know yeah i think so too i'm going to a quick uh, a quick lip pillow change here <laughs> just for yeah, just for for my sins, my shout out to to a lot of the a lot of the UK econ boys, the, the classic snus pouches, the nicotine pouches, lip pillows we would call them. <laughs> they are they are excellent. Nicotine is superior stimulant to caffeine. I just like to put that in there. But yeah, so we're saying they they only they only can, I suppose, deliver excellence at scale. It's not it's not a certainty. Yeah, I suppose that that they will. So. Then for that, that does still keep us on Dubai. I, 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 I'd like to, like to give my take on this after yours, just to see how they line up. But how have you liked it here? Because you, th- this is this is funny. I noticed this about this is why I say you and Kieran are quite similar, and that you're very much just okay. The, the the time to action when you make a decision is very is very quick. Uh-huh. Do you mm-hmm. know? So, I was considering Dubai months before you, and you moved there four months before I did. So, obviously, you did it quite quickly. I'm not. I'm. I'm not certain if I would say that you took to it like a duck to water necessarily. I don't know if you if you settled in that quickly or what your thoughts were when you came here. So you came here in December. Yeah. How did you initially like it when you when you came here, and then how is that? How have your opinions on Dubai then have they changed a bit up to now? What as you've gotten more context on the place? I think it's really what you make it. So when I moved uh, in December, obviously Canada's dark, cold. Um, like in the in the winter, it gets dark like 3 p.m. It's like minus 20 degrees. So it's not hard to like a place more than that yeah. for me because I like being outside. I like the sun. So even just being somewhere nice was huge. I just liked it better for that reason alone. In terms of Dubai itself, I think it's really what you make it. Like you could go party, be on yachts yeah. every weekend if you wanted to. But like I think I've drank. I haven't even gone out since I've been here. I've been here almost a year. Haven't had one night out, not a single night out. So I think for like business, it's it's 
a really good place to dial in. Like you can you can have a really high quality of life. You can have mm -hmm. like people come clean your house. Your barber can come to your house. You can have everything is very convenient. So you yes. can have a, a very uh, a life designed strictly to focus on your business, where you can like wake up, and then the time zone is actually somewhat helpful in a way because yep. right now it's what uh, it's like one almost one p.m. Mm -hmm. Back home where all of our clients are, it's like three in the morning. So we have yeah. had the whole morning to whatever we wanted on our business with nobody emailing, nobody texting, nobody overall distracting us. So I think it's yeah. um, you can you can live a very high quality life that's convenient. You, there's tons of good restaurants to go for dinner, and you can just really lock in on your business. And obviously, connections wise, it's very good to meet people. Um, yeah. Like the guy helping me with my brand sourcing products, yeah. met him in Dubai. Um, so it's very very good for met like Andre. Yep. Dev, like that was all from people in Dubai. Yep. So very, very good connections wise. Um, you'll see people doing the opposite, like going partying, spending all their money. But then you see people who, like in my building who have lived here for 10 years, who have family and kids here who say they would never go anywhere else because they can send their four-year-old daughter to school in an Uber and not worry. Yeah. So there's kind of these two sides of it. And I think it really depends what you make of it. I completely agree. And on the convenience thing, like you touched on, I remember this was in April. I was cooking dinner one night and I was making a big, a big stir fry. And I was like, oh man, I have no salt. So I go on Kareem. And yeah. before the time I was done cooking, the salt was at my door. <laughs> I just sprinkle a bit of salt on I'm like, beautiful. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, th this was, I, I had a, an Instagram reel the other <laughs> night, which actually changed my perspective on life. Potentially the first time that sentence has ever been uttered, but it was, this guy going on about this is on the point of Dubai is what you make of it. And mm -hmm. I think many tier one cities, if you talk about a, a Dubai, a New York, a London, uh, a Singapore, a Kuala Lumpur, Tokyo, these sorts of places, they are what you make of them. So this reel was this guy going on about someone being predisposed to complaining a lot. And he's like, he's saying, when you squeeze an orange, what comes out? The guy in the crowd's like, well, orange juice. He's like, yeah, but why does the orange juice come out? when you squeeze it, when you put pressure on the orange, and the guy's like, because that's what's inside. Yeah. So sometimes I, I've pulled myself in from really complaining about places in general where I realize they are what I make of them. And if I'm complaining about a place, if a place is putting pressure on me and complaints are coming out, it's because that's what's inside. It's because that's that's what I'm making of the place. Yeah. Do you know, even you're talking about connections, you've just connected me with someone this morning who's gonna who's gonna massively help us on, on the business side of things there. You know, these sorts of these sorts of things can happen. And the convenience aspect, you know, I, I think certain people who who trash Dubai a bit, they say, oh, everyone just says it's safe and it's convenient, these sorts of things. I'm like, that are, those are massive things. When you're yeah. saying someone, someplace being safe. When I, I was in London for the summer, I was saying about um, uh, a, a girl I knew there, that she'd be saying to me that she wouldn't like going outside at night without me. Yeah. You know, like she would, like doesn't like walking like alone at night. And this is actually the reality in, in, in many cities around the world where, yeah. where the, the, the safety element isn't... How can, you, how, you, how can you quantify that in terms of your life? Like, you literally don't feel safe going outside at night. Like, yeah, it's, <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't quantify that. So the, the, those elements are, are, are insane. And also just the, the thought process when you're here, you see... Big. You see big. I think, like, for me, a lot of people, when they talk bad about it, it's not... It's, there's two two groups of people who talk bad about it. One is just like, can are women even allowed to like drive there? Like, you know, like questions like this, like, mm -hmm. which just isn't out of touch with reality at all. Like, it's pretty much the same. I would yeah. say for a, a girl here is in the West, you can like pretty much do everything yeah. the exact same. Yeah. But the other group of people is just like, oh, it's so fake, it's so flashy, it's just like all materialistic, which I think there's a side of it that is. Yeah. But if, like you said, if that's what you care about inside, that's where you're going to notice. Exactly. Like that's, if you're, if you're not like that, like if you don't really care about that stuff and you just have a family, like you're probably not going to think that. Not like I've talked to people who have like full families here and like they say they love it and like they're clearly not like that at all. So it's really what's inside of you. Yeah. And that leads us, I'd like to dispel one myth as well about Dubai, where people say Dubai doesn't have a culture. Now, Dubai doesn't have a culture the way Canada or Ireland have a culture in the sense that it hasn't evolved over that much time. Now, there's an older Dubai culture. It was, yeah. big, you know, fishing center and, you know, a trade post and this sort, of, this sort of thing. But it absolutely has a culture, just not in the typical way, where the culture is people like us together. Well, even the, the, the culture is that it's one big mastermind. And that, and it's also, it's just like, it wants to be the biggest and the best of the coming world. Like, like it wants to be the center, uh, like the Middle East overall will be like the Europe, 
200 years ago or like the US yeah. in the 1900s like Middle East wants to be that now mm -hmm. it's just like the place right now yeah. it almost feels like with yeah. everything going around like look around in the construction like there's literally insane things going up every day yeah and we're even I don't think, was I talking to you about this we're looking at Saudi and what the things that they're doing they're you know Dubai had three main reasons that it that it grew so quickly which was the audacious construction projects to bring in foreign investment zero tax and then obviously people don't know this but the biggest industry in dubai is money laundering yeah now that's the same in london but they just have crown dependencies and former colonies where they can launder it technically not through the uk but the audacious construction projects to bring in foreign investment saudi are really trying to compete with that now so it's this whole region is trying to compete with that now Iran are even talking about huge construction projects they have a lot of oil and a lot of money so this whole region it's not where it's just Dubai Abu Dhabi I haven't been I, I hear it's a completely different vibe to Dubai a lot more conservative and things like that but this whole region is is really popping up now yeah and Dubai is certainly the leader in it got got sort of the head start and bringing over some of the best talent from around the world but we're going to see this whole region pop off very very quickly here i love being in old places in in europe seeing old, old sites that's I, I genuinely draw enjoyment from that but they are they can only offer you portals to the past yeah it's not it's not what's, it, it not is what's a, coming it up. is just a different energy or feeling being like when you go to europe it is almost like a it almost feels like you're living in the past in a mm -hmm. way you know what i mean where like now when you're here it feels like you're on the forefront yeah you know what i mean it is so. I, I would still say London is still my favorite city in the world. I will. I will say. I've never that. been. I would highly recommend going. Just the 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 nicest areas of London, I think, are truly stunning. But I, I see so much validity to to being here. Mm -hmm. You know, for for anyone, particularly if you're, excuse me, particularly if you're in if you're very far along in a career, if you run a business. Like I think for us, we always say like if. If Dubai was an hour flight flight from home, we would one hundred percent live here for the rest of our life. Mm -hmm. It's the only dis the only issue is the distance. It's a fifteen hour flight to go see our family. Yeah, which is which is <laughs> which is really tough. I mean, yeah. So we'll still have the have the Dubai set up. I mean, did you contemplate any other places where you when you were thinking of, of moving away? Because there are there are other places you yeah. can go to. There are you can do the whole Paraguay thing, which some people do, and and you can you only have to be there once every three years and things like that. Yeah. You can do, um, you could kind of do Singapore a bit. You could do up until the end of this year. You could have done Portugal, Spain. Kind of has a little bit of of that as well. Malta is another one. Did you ever look at any other places, or were you like, no, this is this is going to be the place I base myself? So like when I first started ecom, like before I was even doing well, I, I knew I wanted to move somewhere nice. Mm -hmm. So I was like thinking Bali maybe. But very like, as soon as I started doing well financially, it was like, okay, I don't want to live in a. I got like a lot of these places you mentioned are like, like especially like Paraguay are like second, third world countries. Yeah. So I, I don't really think I would want that. Um, as soon as it's like I was, I was doing it for not just being in a nice place weather wise. As soon as it was like tax wise as well to like save money, Dubai was the only real option that made sense. But I always wonder like, what about like, Monaco? Like, could mm. you do? Could you? Could people like us just go set up a business in Monaco or like what's is that possible or is it only like you have to first have a whole bunch of wealth and then you can move to Monaco? I think it's some I think it's somewhat in the latter there. Yeah. I think it's it's very it's a uh, I think it's even how expensive it is, it's a level up from Dubai, which is crazy. But you, you touched on there, you knew you wanted to move to somewhere nice. And this was probably a, a reason I it's a big reason why I started the business that I did want to I want to be able to go to different places and that's something I've been doing up till now. So this is actually going back in the chronology. But when you were when you were in your final year of law school, obviously you sacked it off. You were thinking, no, yeah. I don't want to do this. Was that w w did you want to get into business not just for to not just for the the financial incentive of of if it if it really succeeds, you can you have the financial incentive. But even when you were studying to be a lawyer. Were you thinking was that one of the main things you were thinking about if you want to you want to move elsewhere yeah like i was trying to move to new york as well to be a lawyer like i don't know i just thought i i, I wasn't happy like mm -hmm. I, I knew that it wasn't what i was supposed to be doing like i always like for example i i was never really content like I, in universities i transferred universities twice yeah i moved from like nova scotia to toronto to kingston like i, I, I was never happy with where i was 
it was just like I went when I got the law job. I first got a job in one city, and then I quit that firm, got back, went through the recruitment, and got another job. And it was just because I I, I knew I was internally I knew I wasn't happy. Like I didn't want to do what I was doing. I wasn't. Yeah. But I think business is almost like it's financial, but it's also just like you kind of control your own destiny in a way. Yeah. You don't have to answer to anybody. Like if it's really on you. So it, it it's cliche, but it almost turns life into a bit of a video game. Like. For sure. Like you have complete control over where you live, over what you do, over your income, and it gives life flavor. Like you're not just going to a job, sitting at a desk, having to call someone your boss, going yeah. home. Every day is different. Like right now it's 1230, whatever, on a Thursday, and we're just at a podcast studio filming, and no one can tell us not to do that. Yeah. So I think for me it's just like having the ability to do that and really live life on your own terms was what game the fulfillment. Yeah. Yeah, you, you can never lose appreciation for that. I had like a big event in, in August, which maybe not even like the practice gratitude way. I just have so much gratitude after this. But I'm interested from when you, from going into going into being a lawyer, your first choice was obviously hockey. And yeah. you were very good at hockey by all accounts. I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know anything really about hockey. It's enjoyable to watch for sure. I know that much. But... From, from going into then being a lawyer, so we're going way back in their chronology here, but this is just something I'm, I'm interested in. So was your plan to play in the NHL and kind of and go go really far with hockey? And then when you realized, I know you had some injuries and things like that, then was being a lawyer, was that something you were like, that sounds good? But you didn't really, you maybe didn't bet it to see if that was something that you would have enjoyed. It was yeah. maybe maybe pressure from your school, maybe pressure from your family. You know, all, all well-meaning, of course, but from from the decision there, was that a bit of a was that a bit of a almost a, a gut punch nearly not being able to to go on and be and play pro and hockey with 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 how kind of tough the sport is and stuff like that. Yeah, so like I was, I was like when I was younger, I was like one of the top players like in the country. So I think like once you're when you're good at something young. So then I obviously had injuries, stopped playing hockey. And then I was just like, I went from like being like one of the top players in Canada at like 15, 16, to being 18 years old with 70% average in university doing nothing. So I, I just wanted, I had lost like my identity. For the first like 18 years of my life, I was like, oh, 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 my whole identity was shaped around hockey, mm -hmm. athlete. And then I lost it. So then I was like, just like a random run of the mill kid. So then I think like, Ego wise, when you're really good at something, you want to be really good at another thing. Yep. Like you naturally just, if you're the best at one thing, you want to then be the best at whatever you do, or else you'll feel like you almost like peaked when you were young. So then for me, it was like, okay, I'll like a lawyer just sounded good in my head. I'll be like the top lawyer in a big city. Yes. Like that sounded good in my head. Like that sounded like somewhat comparable to being a, an athlete, being the top lawyer in a big city. So then I liked the idea of it, but I didn't like the actual reality like gotcha. like the, the thing with law is like when you're a first year lawyer you do first year lawyer things when you're a second year lawyer you just like there's no you have no way to advance quickly like if you were the best first year lawyer ever you're still not going to be a partner for seven years no matter yeah. what you do you have no real control so then um business gives you all that back and yeah. the, the best like i'm very grateful i stopped playing hockey because like i see so many of my friends who even played pro they're like 28 years old making like 30, 40 grand a year in Europe, no no idea what to do. Injuries. Injuries, no idea what to do. Even, even if you are really good, like let's say if you're the best hockey player in the world, you play to like you're 35, and then what? Yeah. Like I, you can code, like only so many guys can be coaches and stuff. Yeah. Like with business, like you can literally do it from the rest of your life. Like Ray Dalio is running Bridgewater as like an 85 year old guy still, or he was, Phil Knight, like these guys like did it yeah. their whole life. So there's really no, um, you can, it's a it's a lifetime thing. Yeah, with all the same benefits as sports. Yeah, that, and it brings us to an interesting concept of how you can the, the past isn't static either. Yeah, where you can rewrite that. Where you had, I think it was, you know, hockey's such a tough sport. I think you were saying your shoulder, your knee. You had you had some. You took a few belts there and things like that. Um, and that sort of prevented you from going on to 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 the top level. I'm sure that's very common in a, in a sport that yeah. physical. But let's say if you had just languished and went on a downward spiral from there, that would you would look at that event as being like, oh, that was the fault. That was when we fell off. But since that created a sort of hormetic effect going into business, the the events that, that happened there they are objectively the same. Yeah, like the, the, those events happened. 
but now the context in the past is completely different because of what's happened since i would have a similar thing from when i started from when i stopped rowing when i was about 18 i didn't wouldn't be able to i just didn't have i didn't want to go to like i didn't want to do the things it would take to to kind of push on to the next level and things like that and then my buddy actually i started the same day which is qualified for the olympics for ireland and rowing now i wouldn't have been at his level but but still <laughs> um but now from 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 quitting that and then having a year of being in a downward spiral that now looks like an inflection point rather than the fall off point yeah exactly because it's like if i kept playing like say if i didn't get hurt mm -hmm. and i kept playing and then i went and played pro somewhere i could very well be 26 years old with 27 years old with nothing right? yeah but it was like that it almost was like so bad injury wise that i had to stop that ended up being the turning point yeah. so it's it's a it's a it's cliche again, but like a, a lot of the time, like the worst events at the time, you, it's really up to you to rewrite that though. Like huh. you can make these bad events the best thing, but it's really up to you. Cause like a lot of my friends didn't do that. Like they stopped and then they just live in their hometown, average life, average income because they didn't rewrite that. Like that was their peak. Yeah. It's, it's a very interesting concept where these things aren't static ultimately. Yeah. If you add, you know, Michael Jordan's dad pushed him very hard. Now he looks like a genius. But then someone else could push their kid very hard, and it could lead to all, all kinds of all kinds of things. If that was a different, if, if let's say if it, was, if it was even a sibling of Michael Jordan, the dad's the same, the same, the same things pushing. But it, but it, in one case he looks like a genius, the other case he looks like a tyrant. It's up to the person. Like if you have like an alcoholic father, you, the kid can either become an alcoholic or the kid can be the exact opposite because of that. Yeah. But it's the same event. It just depends on how that person individually yeah. writes it themselves. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a good point to to finish that on in the sense that, yeah, we'll, we'll continue rewriting things. We'll continue, we'll continue pushing on. We'll, you know, that, I think it was a very interesting chat. We'll probably push on and do another check-in podcast probably in April time or something like that. Just seeing how things have evolved since then because, yeah, we're continuously, like we're saying, even o up until now, those events that aren't static, they're still changing. Yeah. They're still changing. We still don't know what the what the learnings what the learnings were from those, what will happen. But yeah, it was a it was a sick chat. We'll continue continue doing what we're doing. Continue pushing. Sounds good, brother. Pleasure. Yeah, pleasure. Cheers. Should I start a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you should.